delivering comments for the university's annual celebration of Dr. Ronald E. McNair. This year being the 35th commemoration and celebration, we are unfortunately unable to gather in person, but it makes it no less important that we honor such a great man whose legacy remains one of triumph, excellence, and worthy of emulation. The City of Greensboro recognizes Dr. McNair's earnest contributions to the world as a physicist and a NASA astronaut, as well as the vibrant life he lived, embracing the arts and music and martial arts. The City of Greensboro drafted a resolution in 1998 setting aside January 28th each year thereafter in honor of Dr. Ronald E. McNair. I am here today in honor and in continuation of that long-standing tradition. I will recite a brief portion. Whereas in 1984, Dr. Ronald E. McNair, a graduate of North Carolina A&T State University, became the second African-American astronaut in the history of the United States space program. His accomplishments have brought distinction and recognition to North Carolina A&T State University, the city of Greensboro, and the state of North Carolina. Now therefore be it resolved by the city council of the city of Greensboro that the date of January 28, 1998 and the same date each year thereafter is hereby set aside as a day of special recognition in the honor of the life's accomplishment of a true American hero, Dr. Ronald E. McNair. Adopted this 17th day of February, 1998. A copy of the complete resolution will be placed in city records and one will be given to the university. I will always remember the unifying words of President Ronald Reagan when he addressed the country. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us by the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. Thank you for honoring the life of Ronald McNair. He made North Carolina A&T proud, and I am proud to claim him as our astronaut who lived an exemplary life. Godspeed, Ronald McNair. Thank you for this opportunity. Greetings. I am Dr. Melody Pierce, the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at North Carolina A&T State University. We thank you for joining us for the 35th annual commemorative memorial for Dr. Ronald E. McNair. As we take the time today to honor the legacy of Dr. McNair, we have asked both our current and former students from A&T and across the country to share how Dr. McNair's life's work has impacted their studies and career choices. We are honored that Dr. McNair received his bachelor's of science degree in engineering physics, graduating magna cum laude from A&T in 1971 and received his PhD in physics from MIT in 1976. Dr. McNair has been an inspiration to all Aggies, both current and former students, and has touched the lives of so many on the domestic and international level. I'd like to leave you with a quote by Dr. McNair. Whether or not you reach your goals in life depends entirely on how well, you prepare for them and how badly you want them, end of quote. I want to thank you for joining us and enjoy the Dr. Ronald McNair Memorial Celebration. Thank you, Chancellor Martin, Mayor Vaughn, and Vice Chancellor Pierce for bringing greetings as well as the presentation of the resolution. Today, we honor the legacy of Dr. Ronald E. McNair, the future of space exploration and security. The celebration today reflects on Dr. McNair's contributions as an alum, astronaut, researcher, STEM advocate, friend, and family man. 
Because of Dr. McNair's interest in student engagement and development, students and alum of North Carolina A&T State University and institutions from across the country will be sharing the impact of Dr. McNair's life's work. Today's panel discussion and tributes will focus on how Dr. McNair's impact was far and wide and demonstrates how a young man from a small town like Lake City, South Carolina, can touch the lives of so many. I hope today's program inspires you, like Dr. McNair said in his commencement speech at the University of South Carolina, to go forth with the knowledge that you are better than enough. Go forth with the desire to accomplish, to contribute to our society, and go forth with the willingness to fight. I'm Carl McNair, a very proud graduate of North Carolina A&T State University. I'm also the older brother by just 10 months of astronaut Dr. Ronald E. McNair. Today we celebrate the legacy of Dr. McNair, but we also celebrate a and its faculty, administrators, and staff who provided Ron with the academic preparation, educational opportunities, and encouragement when he needed it most. We celebrate people like Dr. Donald Edwards, former physics chair, Dr. Thomas Sandine, advisor, Mrs. Ruth Gore, former director of counseling, and many others at a and who touched Ron's life. When Ron had a major crisis of belief in his ability to succeed in physics, it was Mrs. Ruth Gore who counseled him and said to Ron, you're good enough to graduate with a degree in physics from this university. Those words, you're good enough, became the mantra that carried Ron through the halls of A&T, MIT, and into NASA's space shuttle program. The McNair family is eternally grateful that you cared enough to attend this tribute today. Thank you and may God bless each and every one of you. It is my pleasure to bring you greetings from the McNair family. To have an annual celebration recognizing my late husband and his legacy I'm sure would bring immeasurable honor and pleasure to Ron. Ron enjoyed his years there at North Carolina A&T so much that on his first flight, when given the opportunity to wake up to something that would be pleasant, something he would have pleasant memories, he chose to have North Carolina A&T song the alma mater to play for him. It brought back so many wonderful and happy memories. He told me many stories of his life there at North Carolina A&T, stories of encouragement, inspiration, and support that he received there. Not only great academics, but they were life stories that he told me that he could carry and reflect back to throughout his life. He learned not to necessarily take the easy way, but to be determined to achieve by working hard and steadfast through difficulties and difficult times. He applied these lessons in everything that he did in all aspects. To his honor, throughout the nation, there have been many schools named after Ron and buildings such as the one here at North Carolina A&T, the engineering building, and MIT has their space research building named after him. In the University of South Carolina, there's a space research building, a space research laboratory after Ron, and his name has been placed in the South Carolina Hall of Fame. Uh, and in his hometown in Lake City, South Carolina, there is a complex, actually. The, that's where his mastaba is, the, the cemetery, the grave, rather, with his, um, the grave that's there in a pool of water with sprinklers around it, an eternal flame, and flags. A beautiful wall um, with 
many of his sayings. And it's a beautiful complex that uh, they have created there. And they have, every year, they also have a celebration there. So he's been very well honored around the nation. And then this way, I feel it continues his legacy. And that was to reach our youth, especially. It was one of encouragement. It was one to inspire, to achieve, to reach goals. And so I would like to thank North Carolina A&T for continuing Ron's legacy. Having this celebration continues his legacy. And you've done so for 35 years. Ron, I'm sure, would be deeply grateful for his continuing what he would like to do, and that is encourage and inspire all to achieve. Thank you again. And I hope to see many of your students and hear about their great success. How has Dr. McNair's life influenced my life choices and career? Positively, I might add. I first saw Dr. McNair's image on A&T Register in, on my coffee table in Winston Salem, North Carolina, and I was immediately inspired by him. I matriculated A&T and majored in engineering physics. I participated on the school karate team, so I was emulating him. I have come back later years in life to pursue a PhD in nanoengineering, which is a very daunting task but I often go back to Dr. McNair's struggles when he was getting his PhD at MIT and someone sabotaged his research. And instead of giving up, what he did was he doubled his effort. He reaccomplished five years of work in a matter of weeks and defended his dissertation. So when I get, when I get tired, when I get exhausted, when I've read the umpteenth paper that I don't want to read, I think of what would Dr. McNair do? and I just do it because that's what Aggies do. Most people know the story of my youth and my aspirations of becoming an astronaut. And while growing up, I knew there were many occupations that you could take up in efforts to become an astronaut. And I believed engineering was the only way for me specifically. Um, when I learned about Dr. McNair and his educational endeavors, I knew that I could brighten my horizons as well. And I began studying engineering physics and applied mathematics, but I, I especially studied engineering physics following the footsteps of Dr. McNair. Um, and I'm really familiar with his intrigue of the field now, all that it has to offer and everywhere that it can take you uh, career-wise and opportunity-wise. And although my path is now not to become an astronaut, I do aspire to work in the defense and aviation fields. And however, I could go back to my days of being that little girl that aspired to be an astronaut, and who knows, you all may catch me at your local International Space Station in the next coming years. Dr. McNair's life has impacted me in several ways. First and foremost, if it had not been for the McNair Scholars Program, I would have not received a fully funded um, master's and doctorate. Um, secondly, his life has inspired me to mentor and give back. Therefore, I serve as a mentor to the McNair Scholars Program at Kent State University. As a senior level phys physics major at North Carolina a and Dr. Ronald McNair has shown that it's possible to succeed as a black man in the STEM field. This is particularly important for me because as a first generation student, uh, none of my other uh, family members have graduated from college and looking to Ronald, Dr. Ronald McNair as a role model in STEM and in physics in general have, has served as a goal or a light at the end of the tunnel that I can look forward to at the end of my degree. He has inspired me to inspire others to pursue the same path, to achieve greatness, to be an Aggie, Aggie pride. Dr. McNair's life work has directly impacted my career choice because it has been my dream since the fifth grade to be an astronaut. And even coming to A&T, he's definitely impacted my studies because I remember from fifth grade to even what, the 12th grade? I thought that I had to do aerospace engineering because that was the conventional path. But hearing that he studied physics really allowed me to broaden my perspective and realize that one pathway, just because it works for other people, doesn't have to be your path. And I think from that, it just really 
led into other areas of my life and just allowed me to change how I think and just know that, you know, challenge the status quo, you know, don't box yourself in. And his life showed that over and over again. And I'm eternally grateful for the great impact that he's had on me. Hello and welcome. Welcome to our panel honoring the legacy of Dr. Ronald McNair and our panel featuring future, the future of space exploration and its security. We have a dynamic panel ready this uh, today. So we're super excited to have everyone uh, join us. My name is J Dr. Gilletta Patrick. I serve, um, I work with NASA. I serve as the California Office of STEM Engagement Director located at Ames Research Center as well as Armstrong Flight Research Center. So super excited to be your moderator today, but let's go ahead and jump in. So uh, could each of our panelists uh, please introduce yourself and could you share um, with us what inspired you to pursue STEM and your connection to STEM? Good morning and thank you so much for having me. My name is Joan Higginbotham. I am an electrical engineer by degree. I also have two dual degrees in uh, engineering management and for space systems. Uh, and two honorary degrees that were conferred upon me, one by my alma mater, Southern Illinois University and the University of New Orleans. So for the past 30 years, I've worked for Fortune 500 companies in aerospace, gas sector, and the retail sector. Uh, but I began my career as a rocket scientist at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I launched about 53 space shuttles successfully, uh, and I was in the nerve of the launch center, or the firing room as we call it. Um, I was then selected in 1996 to be part of the astronaut corps and got to fly in space on a 13-day mission to the International Space Station, where we were still building the space station at the time. My primary task was to operate the robotic arm uh, and to finish building the space station. Uh, while I am proud to be one of only three African-American women to ever fly in space, my mission is to get other women, and especially women of color, into the STEM field and ultimately into space. Thank you for the opportunity to share today. I am Danelia Gladden Green, the eldest child of the eldest child of Clinton Leroy Gladden Jr. Whether we start at my devout commitment to serving God, my strong constitution and character, or my academic accomplishments, published books, articles, patents, or corporate and entrepreneurial successes, at my core, who I am and all of the choices that I've made in life can be traced back to my identity as Leroy's granddaughter. My grandfather encouraged me to explore expand and explain. He inspired me to seek answers to complex questions so that, when, so that I would know what I know for myself. And that's so important when you're getting ready to venture out, whether it was at North Carolina A&T in my undergraduate studies in physics, at MIT or North Carolina State or University of Texas at Austin. The discipline of science, technology, engineering, and for me, art and math, or STEAM as it is commonly referred to, was a natural path to knowledge and wisdom. Um, my grandfather planted the seeds of STEM and STEAM, and then teachers like Mrs. Franklin uh, in my sixth grade math class and Mr. Huffaker and my high school physics teacher, they provided water. Therefore, or thereafter, the sunlight of opportunities served to cultivate a lifelong commitment to positively impacting my community through scientific and engineering contributions. My contributions in general, honestly, they, they evolved over time. Initially, I placed a great deal of emphasis on research and development, which later turned into the productization of devices. Um, mostly battery powered handheld devices. I worked with Texas Instruments, uh, Motorola Freescale, Dell Computers, all in the small battery powered handheld device arena with wireless communications. But then um, it evolved into the business side where I directed talent and funded projects. Um, today, my contributions in the area of STEM 
are mostly around inspiring and encouraging others to explore, um, to explain um, phenomena, and then to enable them to patent their ideas. So that's me. Okay, so I'm going to go forward. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Manuel Retana. I'm an aerospace in, uh, engineer at NASA, at the NASA Johnson Space Center. I'm currently working on ECLES systems for the International Space Station. So these are systems that allow uh, astronauts to breathe and live on ISS. Um, I just also obtained my master's in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University. And I'm a proud uh, University of Nevada, Reno, Grab Gold Pack. Uh, this is my Magnair chair. So I, I used to be a Magnair scholar as an undergrad. And um, so some of my areas of research uh, focused on nuclear engineering. Uh, also, my, my first engineering experience is uh, in nuclear engineering. I worked for the National Nuclear Security Administration um, back in 2014. And then I moved to the aerospace field. I worked first for the military, for the US Air Force through the uh, Northrop Grumman. And then throughout my studies, um, I got the, experience, uh, the opportunity to go to the United Kingdom and work for Airbus Corporation. So there was kind of a, a path for me uh, around. And then I eventually get to aerospace, but uh, the dream was always NASA. And so, um, so far I have been working for NASA for about five years and I have been working in different fields such as explosives, uh, space operations, training crew uh, or astronauts to, 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 to uh, do maintenance on the International Space Station. And now um, I have been working on robotics as well as, uh, and, and, and today I, just, I moved to ECLIS. Um, I want to tell you about what inspired me to go into STEM. Uh, if you look at my background, there's not really a lot. So I'm a first generation college student, um, first generation American. My, my parents never went to college. I'm actually the first engineer in my family. Um, and when I was young in Mexico, um, I grew up in Mexico and uh, I, I went to a lab class, a physics lab class. And in this class, one of my teachers showed me a video in which a spacecraft uh, went from the Cape Canaveral to space. And in this video, you could see the earth and then you could see the, the, the solar uh, system, and then you would see the galaxy. And it was so amazing for me. I just, I just thought of it. we were so tiny, and, and it was so exciting. And then the video goes all the way backwards. So it goes all the way back to the solar system, to the planet, and then it goes to a leaf. And then from the leaf, we go to um, the chloroplast and the uh, cells of the plant, all the way to the atomic uh, um, atomic particles and sub subatomic particles. And I learned that in class. So it was just fascinating. And that was the first day I learned about NASA. And since that day on, I always wanted to work at NASA. And so uh, at 15, uh, I told my mom I was going to move to the US to go and study engineering. And that's exactly what I did. And 10 years later, I actually work at NASA. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little crazy. Greetings, everyone. First of all, I just want to say I'm honored to be a part of such prestigious panel. Oh, my gosh. Um, but my name is Diamond Mangrum. I am a recent December 2020 graduate of North Carolina a t State University, where I double major in biological engineering and applied mathematics. And I also had the honor of serving as the 85th Miss North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University 2019 to 2020. Um, and during my time at a I had the opportunity to intern at NASA's Kennedy Space Center and NASA's Langley Research Center. And I'm proud to announce that I've just accepted an offer with Collins Aerospace. So I'll be working with them starting this summer in a quality engineering role. So I'm very excited about that. Um, my introduction to STEM was pretty non-commissional, if I'm being completely honest. It really didn't have anything to do with space initially. Um, I just remember in fifth grade being so frustrated um, watching my grandmother actually battle breast cancer. And I remember in the fifth grade, you know, trying to cure cancer with my limited resources in my bedroom and then thinking like in my fifth year old, I mean, fifth grade year old mind, like, okay, maybe if the cure is not here, maybe it's in space. And I know now looking back, it's like my, my imagination was truly running, but that was when I really got my introduction to space exploration. And I remember my fifth grade teacher, she literally sat down with me um, at recess time, like while all the kids were outside and she helped me look at schools that were good at engineering. And so from then on, that's how my um, spark for 
engineering or science just really took off. So I'm eternally grateful. And yeah, once again, thank you for having me. This is where I need that virtual applause. This is a uh, power pack panel. Um, so we're gonna just uh, start out with the first question to Manuel. Um, I feel like I have connections with each one of you. Um, Manuel, I actually started my NASA career out at Johnson Space Center. So as a flight controller, so whoop whoop to flight controllers. Uh, so Manuel, NASA continues to write the story of human exploration and technology and science. But they're, they're not the only ones writing this story. As other countries seek to reach space, what are some potential challenges surrounding uh, personal and national security? Thanks so much. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the US has always been a leader in human space exploration. And now more than ever, as other countries emerge to create their own space agencies, and start looking for space, I think we should be as mo as involved as possible in this, I guess, uh, capability development. Just because you cannot really lead and, I guess, control the transfer of information if you are in the outside. If the U.S. Uh, decides that, you know, I'm just going to work with these people and not with the other ones, and, and this might be a little political, but uh, I think as a leader, being there and, and seeing how countries organize and, and, and create space missions, we can influence more of these countries as opposed to kind of alienate them. Uh, and, and so in that, in that sense, I think uh, that's, uh, that's how we can lead. And we can also lead by doing scientific, um, scientific discovery instead of trying to um, do, uh, I guess, weapon development in space in that, in that domain. Uh, we have been doing very well with, with the International Space Station, for example. The Russians and the Americans were extremely, I guess, uh, against each other in the Cold War. But with the International Space Station coming, I mean, they, 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 uh, they joined efforts. They were able to secure, I guess, more funding. But they also became a coalition to, to allow other nations to participate in space. And we have been very, very successful right now with um, the new program going to the moon. I think that the, it has not been, of, I don't know if it is official now, but uh, uh, I, I think Russia is going away and I, I, I foresee this being uh, bad, bad for space. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to see in the future any you know, militarization of space. I think that, that's what a lot of all scientists fear um, and I think we should be more involved, especially with developing countries such as Latin America and Africa and Middle East, with these countries that are trying to, you know, explore and, and participate. I think we should be there helping them out. Uh, obviously, uh, we, need to, we need to control what, you know, what science versus what could become a weapon. And so I think we, we just have to be involved and not being involved is the worst thing that we can do. Uh, definitely, it's one of those cases of we work better together. Um, so uh, great, great points, uh, Manuel. Um, our next question, I'm going to focus this one and really pivot, um, but still leading off of the concept of that, you know, we work better together, but the best way to do that is really through education. Um, I'm going to focus this question to Ms. Higabotham and uh, Diamond. I have to say, I, I follow both of your uh, careers. Diamond, I know yours hadn't been that long, but uh, from one Miss a t to the next, um, I'm super proud of you and just excited to see where you're going. Um, Ms. Higginbotham, I have literally seen you from afar um, and uh, just truly appreciated all your work that you've done at um, NASA and um, in the community. So here's the question for both of you. Uh, 2020 without, you know, without question was a year of pivoting. The education system and even distance learning had to pivot to accommodate reaching and teaching students. In what way should we pivot in our attempts to inspire the next generation? Uh, Ms. Higginbotham, do you mind sharing first? Absolutely. And Dr. Patrick, I don't know if my answer is necessarily for a pivot, because I think it's something that we're doing now, and I, I think we should probably continue to do it. But I think the first thing that we need to do is to get exposed, the kids exposed to the STEM fields because you can't be what you can't see or what you don't know. And the only reason I am an engineer today is because I was um, contacted by the En-ROADS program and they showed me how I could take math and science and parlay that into a career. Before that, I didn't know any engineers and I didn't know what engineers did. So to me, exposure is the key. 
The second thing is that we really need to reach out to kids early. I have a great nephew that's two and he is he is a tech savvy guy. He is on that iPad and he's learning his letters. Uh, and you know, he'll, he'll grow up with technology and it won't be scary for him. So we need to get to the young ladies, especially really early and give them a, a chance to start doing things before their friends get in their ear and tell them how math is hard, right? And how being smart is not a good look for girls. So we need to get our message across to them before they have the noise of all their other friends and all that noise about what they can't do. We need to tell them that they can do things. And the third thing I would say is hands-on activity. I mean, it is really challenging to talk about how cool engineering can be if you're just talking about it. But if you can put your hands on things and you can get kids building rockets or doing an egg drop contest or, or building a small robot and programming it, right? Those engineering concepts become way less theoretical and way more practical. And it's really cool if you take something with your own hands and build it and design it and get it to work. You have a sense of pride and then you have a sense of, hey, this is not really all that hard uh, to begin with. So exposure, reaching out to the kids early and hands-on activities are the ways that I think that we can really engage the next generation and get them really involved and interested in STEM careers. I honestly think Ms. Higginbotham said it best, but I'll try to add some extra nuggets. Um, I think, being one of the students who, you know, really endured this entire pivot in terms of like online learning, I think one of the things that I benefited from was having parents in like a support system who's always encouraged my attitudes toward change to be something that's positive. You know, they, my parents have always taught me that, you know, change is an opportunity for growth, change is an opportunity for discovery, change is an opportunity for excitement. And they've just always instilled in me that, you know, the status quo was meant to be challenged. So in my mind, while going through this pivot, um, I think my attitude toward the situation is really what helped me to still, um, you know, be successful in my eyes. And I think that that's really going to be a determining factor for the next generation because, um, for example, coming from especially African-American community, sometimes it's this preconceived notion that, the only way we can be successful is if we're an entertainer or if we're an athlete or if we do these, you know, these this two pronged lane. And I think, like I said, because I was always inspired to step challenge the status quo, I wasn't as nervous to, you know, go the road, let's travel and realize I think I like science and math. And, you know, that may not give me cool points with my friends or, you know, in my environment, but that's what I want to do. And why not? So I definitely think if we just need to continue to inspire the next generations who, you know, dream big that, you know, life is truly lit, best lived at the end of your comfort zone. That's my, one of my favorite quotes. I don't know who said that, but life is truly best lived at the end of your comfort zone. So I think just instilling those things in the minds of the next generation will truly take us to higher heights. Uh, the next question I actually uh, focus to uh, Dr. Glenn Green and really, I think you're a great example of you can't be what you can't see, and you're you're you have such an amazing story. Um, so for you, uh, Dr. McNair was always a great example of mentorship. Uh, his investment in young people could be seen throughout our alma mater. Uh, but Dr. Green, can you share with us about the value of mentorship that you've received and how it affects students pursuing STEM or STEAM careers? I have, since I became self-aware, um, felt loved and encouraged and supported. So at the very foundation, this idea of mentorship and um, having models or examples that um, uh, open your eyes to the opportunities and expose you to new and unheard of things such that your fear is lessened is what I heard from the previous remarks. I've had that as a source for me in my family. And then it grew into having um, instructors, whether in middle school or high school or different um, engineering programs I went to when I was in um, secondary school uh, on college campuses. There was always someone who seemed to take an interest 
in me. And I, I learned to value um, what they were pouring into me and, 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 and made it very real to me when it was time to go to college. And I had letters of recommendation from those people who had been um, beacons and a light for me to encourage me and to steer me in good and positive directions. When I got into school, I, I had professors asking me, you know, I just really wanted to meet you. This was after I'd completed my studies at North Carolina a and in, in the physics department where Dr. Gilchrist and Dr. Williams pour into me, Dr. Sandy. I mean, these are people that I haven't seen for maybe a decade or two. And they and their impact in my life is still very tangible. There was one young lady that when I got to MIT, she was like, you know, I had to meet you. Your letters of recommendation just spoke so highly of you. And that meant that they didn't only just want to pour into me for the time that I was under their direction, but they wanted to put me on a path that would open a door that I didn't even know I was going to one day want to go through. And that's what mentorship can do. You, you, you never can pay back um, you know, to those individuals who have poured into you um, through their mentoring and modeling of examples. But what you need to do is pay it forward. And that's why it's so instrumental to me or so important to me that when I get an opportunity to share with young people who are trying to make a decision or if they have a misconceived idea about what it means to be a physicist or what it means, you know, why I, I want to be an entrepreneur and, um, you know, I don't see why I need to work for corporate America. Well, I've had an opportunity and had those who were examples to me all along the way to be in both of those areas. So I share my story. It's almost like, and again, I, I don't know if everyone's comfortable with this, but it's almost like being a witness for Christ. You can share your story. It doesn't mean that other people are going to model it exactly, but it does mean that they may, um, it may trigger something in their brain that allows them to unlock all of that potential that they have that they can capitalize on for the benefit of others. And that's the value of mentorship for me. And that's the value of the example that Dr. McNair shared. Thank you for that. You know, I almost wanted to say, girl, you preaching. <laughs> I'm sure um, uh, mentorship is, is, is tremendously valuable. And I'm sure uh, all of us, um, on this panel can think of somebody who mentored us uh, through this process to be where we are. Um, I have to, I have to ask this question. Uh, this question is for uh, Ms. Higginbotham. Uh, being a part of the astronaut corps, I mean, you know, that's few and far between being an African-American in the astronaut corps is few and far between being an African-American female. In the astronaut corps, it's just few and far between. So I have to ask, what was the most exciting or interesting thing that you've done as being a part of the astronaut corps? So asking that is like asking who your favorite child is. And even if you have one, you shouldn't answer the question. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you like a top three because it's really hard to say there is one most exciting or interesting thing. So honestly, flying in space was just fantastic. It was an incredible way that I got to represent my country, uh, and it was the most awe-inspiring uh, thing that I've probably ever had, to, uh, I've gotten a chance to do in my entire life, and we could spend a whole another 30, 40 minutes on just the space flight alone, but obviously uh, flying in space was the highlight of my career after sending hundreds of astronauts into space before uh, I actually be got to I got to become one. The second thing was getting to travel all over the world and share my journey uh, of space and to just tell people about the incredible um, scientific things that we get from space exploration because a lot of people think, oh, why do you go in space? You know, we can use that money down here. And, and it's nice to be able to say these are the tangible benefits that we have received from space exploration. So getting around, getting to go around the country and share that with people has been great. But I have to say, uh, coming in uh, very close to the space flight itself is being able to go around and talk to young kids and to inspire them about the endless possibilities that they have 
uh, in their lifetime. Um, they have way more opportunities than I had when I was coming up. And I go and I try my best to let them know that the sky, I, growing up I heard the sky is, is the limit. And I always say the sky is no longer the limit because there are just boundless opportunities for those children. And of course, selfishly, I try to steer, steer them into careers in STEM and hopefully ultimately space. So those are my, my three biggest takeaways from my time in the astronaut corps. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that. Uh, being an inspiration is, is just, it's just so key. Um, my next question is, is going to be focused to Manuel. I, I have to admit, Manuel, your story is amazing. Being a first generation, um, you know, college graduate. But I want to ask you a question about space exploration. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're spending a lot of money on space exploration. Um, and so just in your thoughts or your opinion, can you share well, what is the real benefit of that? Oh, you know, I, I love this question. I, I always love it. And, and I want to start with something simple. So your cell phone, right? Um, the integrated circuit was introduced on the Apollo computer that went to the moon in 1969. Uh, and, and through that, you know, through that development, uh, we eventually got to the integrated circuits we use in these cell phones and desktop computers. So if you use a cell phone every day, which I think everybody does, uh, and, or a laptop, that's a benefit of space exploration, right? GPS, something that we use all the time to walk, to bike, to drive, to fly. GPS is also a benefit of space exploration. The military uses it, even companies, when you go, and do a business transaction on the bank, they use the GPS stamp to, to be able to do this transaction. So we use it for that. Forecasting, you know, weather forecasting, when you, um, when you uh, wanna go outside and it's, uh, you don't know if it is too cold or warm, you know, it kinda helps you day to day, but it also saves lives. In, in Houston, there's a lot of hurricanes. So if that season is coming up, weather forecasting can be, you know, the, the, the means between life or death. And uh, obviously, I think that the most uh, evident, and I think everybody has talked about it, inspiration. I mean, the, one of the reasons why I love space so much was Star Wars. I loved these movies when I was growing up. And the fact that I'm able to work in space today is just because of that. So it inspires a whole generation and more people join STEM. So that's what I have. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think we don't realize how much uh, space benefits us in our day to day. Uh, life. So appreciate you highlighting those points. Uh, my next question is for Diamond. Um, I definitely need to say congratulations on graduation. Uh, so could you tell us, you know, what are you looking forward to most um, with regard to your upcoming career with Collins Aerospace? Um, so the nature of the program that I'm coming into, it's like a rotational program. So I'll be able to, you know, really dive into three different areas. And I think that's what I'm most looking forward to, just knowing me as a person. I I love change. I love new stimulations, all these things. And I think the nature of my um, majors, you know, biological engineering and applied math, you know, are more on the soft sciences side. So I'm really looking forward to, like, developing my technical skills. And so I think that Collins, an opportunity that, you know, I've been afforded is literally everything I could have asked for, you know, the opportunity to travel um, and live in new places, you know, because I've been in North Carolina for four years and then Maryland my, the rest of my life before then. And so I'm really excited to be in a new environment. I'm ex like really excited to dive into new projects and to really just, you know, grow as a scientist, engineer and prepare myself for, you know, eventually applying for the astronaut course. Well, you, you can, you know, do, that's where you do your wink, wink. <laughs> you, probably, you, probably. <laughs> you know, I want to ask the question, where are we going? Where are we going with space exploration? Um, let me start out with uh, Ms. Higginbotham and go to Manuel Diamond and then uh, round that out with Dr. Glenn Green. Uh, so, Ms. Higginbotham. So thank you for that question. We are we are going forward to the moon is what NASA is saying. And yes, we've been to the moon before, but this is going to be a little different this time because we're trying to send the first woman to the moon, which is incredible. And 
hopefully that one will be a woman of color because there have been several that uh, are on the team who will be training for the moon missions. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, talk about breaking the glass ceiling or in this case, the, the glass sky, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, and then after that, we're trying to go to Mars in roughly the, the 2030 timeframe. Um, the beautiful thing of this is that we're going to a different part of the moon. We're going to a place where they think uh, you can actually exist because there's ice that's there. So if there's ice, obviously there's water and maybe you can make uh, use that to make fuel and different other things and to sustain life. So this time when we go back, it's not just to collect rocks and moon dust. It's really to try to start and have a permanent presence on the moon, uh, which would be really interesting. Uh, and just for, I'm putting it out there, anybody from NASA listening, I'm happy to go. Uh, so you just call me up. Uh, so very exciting stuff. It is a really good time to be in space exploration right now. Uh, and I'm excited for NASA and the things that are we, we are doing in the space industry. Um, when I was a kid, and maybe the the the, the kid uh, the, the people listening to this won't know, but there was a cartoon called The Jetsons, right? And in The Jetsons, there was this few family of the future that lived like in a space needle, like in Seattle. And they would uh, talk to each other through the computer in video calls. I mean, this was completely like fiction. It was, it, when I was a kid, this was fiction, completely fiction. And today we do it. I mean, right now you're watching five people from different parts of the world uh, talking to you. And, and um, there was also, when I was a kid, I was very frustrated because um, my mom told me that there was two types of cars, right? So there was the standard transmission car and there was the automatic transmission car. And I, for me, automatic mean, you know, the car drives itself. You know, you have this stick shift and you just put it on automatic and it takes you wherever you want. And I was so angry when she told me, no, 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 it's just a transmission. It doesn't take you places. But today there's Tesla cars that can actually take you whatever you want. And so the future is today and the world is changing. But with that, you know, comes a lot of responsibility. Um, there is weaponization of all these type of technology. And so we have to be careful as scientists as we, you know, it's good to accelerate and try to move forward, but we have to be careful and, and we have to be cautious on how we move and what type of technologies help humanity and we, what type of technologies could not. So we just have to be careful, but that's what I have to say. Well, I think they gave a great summary of what's really in the works, but you know, if you let my mind run, wow. You know, I know it's in the works, but I'm really excited for commercial space flight because I mean, I know, it's, you know, SpaceX, like they're working on it, but I'm excited for that and I'm hoping I'm very hopeful that I will see that in my generation because I, as much as I want to experience space, I would love for my family and my loved ones to experience it too. Um, that may just be some of my passion just overflowing to wanting everybody to be a part of it. Um, but I'm really excited about that and I'm really excited about the new inventions that will come about um, due to the things that we're working on for space exploration. So, like I said, they probably gave them more practical, like, hard these are the goals but you know i'm just hopeful well all of the thoughts that i that came to my mind have been stated um i was very surprised when manuel talked about the jetsons because i figured i was the oldest one and i would be the one who would bring up the jetsons but indeed um that was where my mind went and then you know diamond uh went and hit on the nail that says you know commercial space exploration i think we're dabbling in that area um, I'm in the process of planning a 30 year wedding anniversary um, where our whole family is going to go out of the country together to Africa. But, you know, maybe around 40 or something like that, maybe we could all go to space together. Maybe there is a resort out there that's going to be developed where life is sustained and we could, that could be our 40th anniversary trip. <laughs> what is one piece of practical advice? you would give to someone pursuing a STEM or STEAM career? Um, and I'm gonna go with Manuel Diamond, Dr. Gladden Green, and if Ms. Higginbotham can close us out. Uh, so Manuel, what's that one piece of practical advice? So uh, I have a little bit, I guess. Um, so uh, the first is dream. Uh, I want people to, to dream and dream big. You know, if it can happen in your brain, it could happen in reality. Um, watch a lot of sci-fi movies. You know, Iron Man is very good at, at that. 
but um, STEM is hard for STEAM is hard for a reason, um, and it's because if you build a bridge and it collapses, uh, not only you know people can be in danger, but you also waste a lot of money, and that's a reason why STEM is very hard. And I'll give you a little bit of a story. So uh, when I was in undergrad, I took my first physics exam. I was, uh, I think, a freshman. And in that exam, I got a 27 out of 100. And I was the, and I came from a very good high school, and I was in physics honors, and I thought I knew physics. And then I got a 27 out of 100 in exam. And I, um, I was above average because the whole class got like 22. That was the average of the whole class, 22 in, 100, in an exam that was out of 100. If I let that put me down, uh, I would not be here talking to you today. And so I just ask people to fail. I mean, uh, part of science is, is failing. You got to know how to fail, how to take failure, how to learn from failure, and fail forward and fail and learn from, from, from your failure. So, I, you know, if, if I would say something to, to people, don't give, don't give up. Um, failure is an option. Um, and, uh, and I just tell people, you know, uh, don't judge your character by a number. I mean, ju judge yourself by what you learn. Um, I think my piece of advice would definitely draw from like one of like my favorite quotes from Ronald McNair. I don't really know it <laughs> word for word, but basically it just talks about whether you're going to reach your goals or not depends on how badly you want them and how much you're willing to prepare for them. And I think that that is so important, especially for, you know, middle school age or high school age, because I, I think a lot of people you know, may struggle in a math class and then are completely discouraged from wanting to go into STEM. But one thing I, I'm a witness for is that, you know, like you said, I, I remember failing my first test um, in calculus, my first class at a and and I failed it. And that really could have been like a determining factor for me to like give up on that. Um, but that class just like really showed me that I like the challenge. And if you are willing, if you want it bad enough and you're willing to prepare hard enough to get to your goals, that science could truly be for you. It's not about having a natural nerd, I guess, pat, like affinity towards it. I don't know, y'all. I'm, I'm the least qualified on this panel. But I'm just saying, I think for me, it came more down to my competitive um, mindset in terms of like, no, I'm going to do this because that that um failing grade tried to really test me and i'm not about to let it win so i'm really just drawing from the fact that you know if you want it bad enough you can do it um and just work hard enough to do, make it happen outstanding um let me just jump on in that theme you know uh, failure is not final and so um dr mildred dresselhaus was one of my mit professors probably my most favored professor. And I remember taking an exam. Um, you know, there was only going to be two exams, a midterm and a final. I had graduated summa cum laude from North Carolina a and I thought that I knew what I needed to know and I had a support system to hold me up. But when I took her first exam in physics and I got like a 61 or 62 or something at a and I'd never seen grades like that. And I was convinced that oh my God, the real awakening is going to happen. And so I got on her calendar and went and met with her in her office. And she sat down and she, she said, well, what are we talking about today? And she, you know, she had seen my background. She was one of the professors I had written to about doing research with her and everything. And um, basically I was saying, I'm not sure if I need to drop this class, but I wanted to talk to you. And she said, well, let me see. And she looked at my grade. And she looked at my participation and attendance and she said, so what are we, why are we talking about possibly dropping my class? And I said, you know, I made a 61. And that's when she showed me just like, you know, um, the others had mentioned, she showed me the class average and I was above the class average. And even when I think about it right now, it almost brings me to tears because the most valuable advice that anyone can tell you is never give up. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good is better and your better's best. I will just say very succinctly, believe and achieve. I feel that if I uh, just a uh, young lady from the south side of Chicago, Illinois, can become one of the few women of color to go in space, uh, then anything is possible. So I will leave you with believe and achieve.
failure is not final and believe our final words. So I just want to uh, take this moment to uh, thank our panel. Thank you, Manuel Ratana, uh, Diamond Mangrum, Dr. Daniela Gladden Green, and Ms. Joan Higginbotham. I applaud all of you. Um, and then thank you uh, to the audience for joining us uh, for this panel to honor the legacy of Dr. McNair. Uh, really looking at the future of space exploration and security. We are super excited for you to have joined us. Thank you. The life of Dr. Ronald E. McNair continues to be inspiring to the students, to the faculty and the staff of the College of Engineering and to the constituents of our greater university, North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. And it's for so many reasons. It's because of our understanding of the man that he was, but also the dimensions of the legacy that he left behind. As a North Carolina A&T student, he earned a bachelor's in physics. Now certainly that is a challenging STEM major, but even in its pursuit, Ron McNair managed to make sure that he made time for family, for friends, and even for extracurricular activities because he understood how that adds back to rejuvenating him in order to pursue his field. And in his case, martial arts was important. Music was important. But even when he graduated with his physics degree from a and he continued to embrace learning. And when he pursued his PhD at MIT, he made sure that even when he reached the rough patches, as we all do, the setbacks in pursuing his degree, he made sure he focused on his goal. And so he managed through and worked through those setbacks. And it was this combination of his intelligence, his hard work and determination that continues to provide lessons for all of us. And then of course, it's his distinctiveness as a person as a person who decades after his death, his legacy still is something that is so important to all of us. It's not only because he was an astronaut, it's because of the fact that while he was even among the stars, he always reached for the stars. And that's one of the reasons why he particularly inspires me. He inspires me to think carefully about making sure that I continue to be impactful in those that I work with and those that I'm around because none of us knows how long we're here. But we do know that for the time that we are here, it's so important that we make the most of it and that we continue to learn and that we continue to make sure that the time we spend is making a difference for others. So I am so pleased uh, that Ron McNair's life existed because it opened so many doors for others and it continues to inspire me decades later. Thank you for this opportunity to speak about that. Hello, I bring you greetings from the Tall Omega chapter of Omega Sci Fi Fraternity Incorporated here in Greensboro, North Carolina. I am honored to have this opportunity to provide you reflections on brother, Dr. Ron McNair, his legacy and his accomplishments. I remember exactly where I was that day in January of 1986, when the Challenger blew up. I was a recent uh, transplant to the Greensboro area and spending time with the brothers of Musai at North Carolina A&T State University, I learned about Brother McNair's accomplishments in becoming an astronaut and he would ultimately be on this Challenger flight. One of the things that I learned about Brother McNair was he was the epitome of an Omega man. He upheld the four cardinal principles of manhood, scholarship, perseverance, and uplift. Ron also looked to help others as he went through his trials and tribulations. And those things are reflection of an Omega man. Brother Minaire often returned to the university to both support the students and his beloved Musai chapter of Omega Sci Fi. The Omega Sci Fi fraternity brothers will never forget the impact that Brother McNair left on the fraternity 
and the world. Thank you. My name is Jordan Kearney, and I am the boss list of the Mu Psi chapter of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated as an undergraduate member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. Dr. McNair made it his business to learn, grow, and inspire those around him. Brother McNair, who was brought into the fraternity in December of 1969 into the Mu Psi chapter, continues to inspire young men of color. His legacy epitomizes our cardinal principles, and his family has continued to uplift others through the foundation, therefore keeping his legacy of uplift alive. Today, we welcome you as we reflect on his life's work and contributions. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Johnson, and I serve as the principal at Ronald E. McNair Elementary in Guilford County Schools. It is my pleasure to report to you that we continue to honor and remember the legacy of Dr. McNair on a daily basis. Each day in our morning announcements, we encourage our scholars to fly to the stars just like Dr. McNair through scholarship and service. We remember his legacy by learning about him and the things he did in his lifetime. Not only was he the second African-American astronaut, but at a young age, Dr. McNair was a civil rights activist by challenging South Carolina's policy for library checkout books. So we use Dr. McNair as an example to our students to continue to advocate for what's right, continue to invest in themselves and their education. We are very, very proud to have his name on our school. And with you, we remember him on this special day. He would come from humble beginnings, a young brother with great dreams and a strong will determining his own tomorrow. It seems a and produces great leaders, some giants in their field, with humble knowledge of whence they come always befriending others in need. McNair took up the Aggie struggle in pursuit of his degree. Then onward to dare, challenge, and trouble MIT for his PhD, he was our hero, this Aggie gladiator. Yet on this note, we all must think. Each person has a pre-score date with destiny we must keep. As Phoenix met his fiery end, so too will he rise again. And on that day of happiness, we will then meet and greet a long lost friend. Think not of our great loss, but of history's gain. Let us remember him by paying the cost he did to rise to fame. And Aggie is best remembered, not just in the tears we shed, but in emulation and earnest dedication of the inspiring life he led. We can only think our loss is to God's saving grace. And know that Ron still thinks of us as we him out there exploring space. From Dare to Cherokee, to infinity and beyond, hanging over the edge, be the Aggie in the room. Epitaph to our hero, Dr. Ronald Erwin McNair. I wasn't really exposed to science and engineering at my early age. So I went into the general engineering studies in college without really understanding what engineering and research were. And I, at my university, um, I learned about Dr. McNair and the McNair Scholars Program. And I saw an inspiring parallel that Dr. McNair came from humble beginnings and was an accomplished musician did his PhD in physics and became a NASA astronaut. So as a first generation college student um, and a pianist, um, I was just starting a college as an engineering student. I wanted to work for NASA, so that kind of inspired me to follow his footsteps. The McNair Scholars Program provided me with an early exposure to a research experience that helped me uh, learn that this is the field that I want to pursue my PhD and my career in. So I was able to learn what it means to do a research and develop necessary skills to succeed in graduate school, which includes not just the technical skills, but also the teamwork, uh, leadership, 
and communication skills. Hello, Aggies and friends. The legacy of Dr. Ronald McNair has meant so much to me in both my early education and also throughout my career. First and foremost, being a Ronald McNair Scholar uh, meant to me to be able to go to school, earn a degree in electrical engineering and graduate debt-free, which you all know means a great deal. But it also meant endeavoring to achieve academic excellence, staying on top of my studies and at and at the peak of my studies, staying on the dean's list and at the top of that. And then throughout my career, I am a, just a lifelong learner and ever curious. And so I'm always studying. Dr. McNair was a, a PhD and going on to earn my PhD and just continuing to serve the communities in my respective space and add value to the academic and scientific fields and knowing that there's space for us in those scientific fields means everything. So being one who is curious, who is a researcher, who is a scientist, and having Dr. McNair blaze those paths for us means a great deal. I feel like Dr. McNair's impact on me has just been you know, getting to share the same space as him, you know, actually getting to go to a and as well, walking through McNair Hall and being an engineer, an aerospace engineer as well, as he was a pioneer in that field. So just getting some inspiration from him, looking up to him, following kind of in those type of footsteps and just McNair, I feel like he has inspired me a lot. Ronald McNair's life works influence my academic studies as well as, as well as my life choices as when I was an undergraduate student at the North Carolina a and State University, I had the privilege of being a McNair scholar. And being a McNair scholar, I was introduced to research, which allowed me the opportunity to engage in research on campus as well as travel to other universities to present at and attend conference. Thus, having that foundation as a McNair Scholar encouraged me to attend graduate school and to pursue a PhD in educational school. Just as Dr. Ronald McNair, I too gained my PhD at the age of 26. I am grateful for the McNair program as well as for Dr. Ronald McNair's work as it encouraged me to be a scientist practitioner in my field of educational psychology. Uh, Dr. McNair's life work has, has impacted my work uh, tremendously growing up uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I never knew that education could be a, main, a means out of your uh, circumstance. I've always saw people with sports and music. And it's funny, when I got to Temple University, I actually uh, went there to play uh, football and worked out and it didn't uh, pan out for me. So I didn't know what I was going to do when I came across the McNair Scholars Program, which I always say uh, saved my life. And my father, uh, he is a police officer. My brother's a police officer. Uh, so I was studying criminal justice. I thought I would become a police officer. Um, and McNair was the first uh, program to tell me that, you know, straight from undergrad, you could apply to a PhD and there would be people there to support you and guide you along the way. Um, and it was through education uh, was a way out for me, learned that I could be paid to think, learned that uh, this could be a long life uh, career for me. So his life work uh, means everything to me.
Thank you, Dr. McNair. 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 So not only do I want to thank you, I want to thank your wife, your family, even your brother, Carl McNair, who has wrote and penned your memoir. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair, for being a leader, for being courageous, for being adventurous, and for being bold, because that is what Aggies do. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. Ronald McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Ron McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. Thank you, Dr. McNair. So I want to thank you that the McNair family thanks you for this honor. <laughs>